In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ, the true light, who enlightens and sanctifies everyone who comes into the world, cause the light of your countenance to shine upon us, that in it we may see your unapproachable light, and guide our steps to the doing of your commandments, at the intercessions of the Most Holy Mother of God, and of all the saints. Amen. <clears throat> the uh, purpose of these lessons is to provide you with a basic knowledge of, of Orthodox theology. And theology is a word that puts a lot of people off, um, because people often associate it with uh, academia, with uh, academic study only, um, and that is a very narrow understanding of theology. Theology is, uh, a lot of people make a distinction between theology and spirituality, and it's a false distinction. Um, these two things go hand in hand. Theology me literally means the study of God, and its purpose is to know God. And to know God isn't simply uh, some, an academic study. It's related to uh, what you know, many would call spiritual life. So we're not going to just be looking at subjects regarding dogmatics. We're going to be looking at all kinds of uh, different uh, areas of orthodoxy. Uh, prayer, fasting, spirituality, sacraments, worship, services. Because um, they all go hand in hand, and we cannot really understand the one properly without the other. Um, now, obviously, some of these subjects are going to be complicated because they are about very difficult subjects. Today is perhaps uh, the first subject is the most difficult. Uh, well, as I said, the theology basically means the study of God. So, I mean, before we go any further, we really have to deal with the, the fundamental theological question. Who or what is God? People use that noun God all the time, but never really think about what we mean by it. And if we don't have some idea of what we mean by that, we're not really going to get very far. And this is really, this, today's lesson is really, uh, the foundation for everything else. We're going to be coming back to this subject again and again. And we will see how so many things in the Orthodox Church, our practices, our beliefs, uh, are all rooted in, in this subject of what we believe about God. The first thing we know about God is that he is unknowable. St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century said, no single thing of all that is created has or ever will have even the slightest communion with the supreme nature or nearness to it. Similarly, uh, St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century said, a comprehended God is not God. Doesn't seem to bode well uh, <laughs> for a series of lessons in, in Orthodox theology. But this is only part of uh, the truth. God is indeed unknowable uh, because he is above all being, iperusios, as we say in Greek. Now, we use certain words to describe God. We say God is love, God is all holy, almighty, all powerful, all knowing. These are all true, but when we use these uh, terms and these words, we are still thinking very much in terms of human experience and human understanding. And uh, these never adequately describe God. Now, while God is unknowable, he is at the same time a God we can know and have a personal relationship with. How do we explain this contradiction? The Church Fathers uh, describe it uh, describe the contradic um, explain the contradiction by making a distinction between what is called God's essence, usia, and God's energies. His, in other words, his uh, his actions, his condescension, his grace, his divine love. What God is by nature, we can never fully grasp or fully know or fully become. But by participation in his love, in his grace, in his energies, we can come to know him. 
God is by nature eternal. By his grace, by his energies, we have everlasting life. Um, God is by nature holy, and by participation in God, by imitating him, by knowing him, we too become holy. Only because of him, uh, because of our participation in him. And, and this is a, a matter of fundamental importance. And many people actually speak of the human soul as by nature immortal. That's actually not true. We only have an everlasting life by God's grace. And this is what is meant when, when we speak of God as creator, because we believe that God is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. When we speak of him as creating everything from nothing, we're not simply talking about some divine watchmaker. He creates everything and then leaves, lets it be. If God withdraws, everything dies. Nothing can exist without him. Um, and it's only by being with him, by participating in his divine energies, that we can even have life. The other, uh, another uh, fundamental thing, and the main, the main subject today, is that we believe that God is Trinity. <clears throat> um, this is always a very difficult subject to explain, but I will do my best. Um, we believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one essence. Now, why do we believe this? The short answer is we believe this because it has been revealed to us in the scriptures, through the prophets, through Christ himself, through the apostles, and the church, through its <clears throat> theology and its tradition, has tried to better explain that revelation. It's not something that we came up with. <clears throat> the uh, formulation of our theology is simply an attempt to help us better understand what has already been revealed by God to us. And of course, many people say, well, you know, what, what's all the fuss about? All these religions arguing, it's all the same God. I, I find it hard to understand how we, anyone can say that. If, you know, a, a monotheist, uh, Jews and, and Muslim, Jewish and Muslim monotheists say, that there is only, God is only one person and there is no Son of God, then I, not only do I not have the same God in the sense that I, I believe that Christ is the Son of God and you don't, but in the sense that the God you are talking about, the Father, for you is not the Father <clears throat> because you don't believe he has a Son. Therefore, he is not the Father. This is why Christ says, whoever has sinned me has sinned the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. If I recognize the Son, then I recognize the Father. And uh, the Son has his source and origin in the Father. We speak of Christ as being begotten of the Father. And this confuses a lot of people because we think, in, again, we think in human terms. We're thinking of uh, there's the Father and then one day the Son comes along. And therefore the Son is created being. And this is a heresy that arose in the 4th century called Arianism. In the handout I gave you, there is um, a little information about that. Because he argued that although Christ is a divine being, he has he, he's not uh, beginningless as the Father is. He had a beginning, he was created. But this is not what we mean when we talk about being begotten. He is a, it explains an eternal relationship between the Father and the Son. You will hear often in scripture when Christ speaks of the Father, he speaks of God, he speaks of the Father. And he, for example, he says, uh, the Father has life in himself, and he has given the Son also to have life in himself. Um, or he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He's always deferring to the Father, but because he is the Son, he shares in the same divine qualities that the Father has. He is by nature God, but uh, it is because he is the Son of the Father that he is God. Similarly, the Holy Spirit has his source and origin in the Father. He eternally proceeds from the Father. 
So we have one source in the Trinity, the Father, and that's why there is one God. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the, the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. But why do we say it's one God? Um, a lot of, you know, many other monotheists accuse us of tritheism. We believe in three gods because we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and again, I think we get confused because we think in very human terms. Um, if we look at the, the actual terms we use in theology for the Trinity, we speak of three persons and one essence. Or let's better to use the Greek terms. We use uh, there's one usia, one essence, and three ipostasis. In other words, three particulars that share that one essence or, or nature. So, for example, three human beings are three ipostasis of one usia, three particulars that share the same nature, human. Uh, you could say the same with a dog or a horse or whatever. So the usia is the essence, the nature of something, and the apostasis is a particular. The problem we have here, is, though, is that we are thinking in spatial terms. We are thinking of three separate entities. And you can't do that with God because God is not a physical being. He is, he is spirit. So although we're making a distinction between the three persons of the Trinity, we are not speaking of separation. If you, for example, take, for example, a flame, a flame emanates both heat and light. They are distinct, but they're not separate. You can't imagine the flame without the heat or without the light, but you can't separate them. They're distinct, they're different things, but they are one. That's how we understand the unity of the Trinity. So we're not tritheists, we are monotheists, but we are not uh, like other monotheists. Because whereas Jewish and Muslim monotheists believe that there's only, there's one divine nature and only one person that has that nature, we believe that three persons have that divine nature. Um, and it's very important to remember, because we're so used to calling ourselves monotheists, that we do forget <laughs> that we are not like other monotheists. And the moment you deny that the Son and the Spirit are God just as the Father is God, you're not a Trinitarian anymore. You're not a Christian anymore. So there is a dis difference between Christian monotheism and other forms of monotheism. Another very important thing about this belief in the Trinity is that you know, if you ask a Christian what is God, rather than who, um, they'd, most would probably quote the epistle of uh, St. John and say God is love. And we hear that and we think, oh, what a lovely idea. We think of love as a nice, fuzzy feeling. But let's think carefully about what that means. God is love. Can love exist without more than one person? Self-love can exist. Is that really love, though? True love is the love of someone outside ourselves, beyond ourselves. Love must have an object. It cannot exist exist without more than one person. And this is important because we read in uh, the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, that God creates everything by his word, but when he creates man, we hear, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And the church fathers see this as the three persons of the Trinity speaking in the plural, let us make man in our image. Which means that man is created for you, for love. He's created to, to have a relationship with other human beings, to love other human beings. This is why God says in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone. And he creates woman. Um, so man made in the image of the Trinity cannot know God, cannot have a relationship with God in isolation. And the only way to imitate the Trinity is to love. But because love is something that cannot be forced, if God is love, then he is also freedom. So when man is made in the image of the Trinity, he is made free to love God or not, to reject him or to accept him. Um, and indeed, this means that man is created with 
free will. The, church, the Greek fathers actually used the term image of God to donate, d- denote uh, free will. Uh, that's what it usually means. We are made in the image of God means that we are free. We are free to love or not to. Um, <clears throat> and man obviously therefore had had the choice and he chose not to follow God's uh, commandments, not to follow God's way and to go his own way. And as a result, everything that is a, the opposite of God enters life. God is by nature life, death enters the world. God is by nature holy, sin enters the world, and so on. And this is why we live in this fallen world. We are no longer able to know God, to become like God, to acquire the likeness of God. That's what is meant by the image and likeness. We have the freedom to become like him. Um, And so man is now completely separate from God. The two cannot meet. God is by nature holy. Man is sinful. God is by nature eternal. Man is mortal. How can the two be bridged together? It's impossible. Unless someone who is both God and man at the same time joins those two together. <clears throat> and this brings us to the incarnation. We believe that our God is an incarnate God. He became a human being like us. More specifically, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, became like us. And this is of absolute, of fundamental importance. Only if God becomes man can man be reconciled to God. There's no salvation otherwise. The only God can reunite us to God, but only if that God is human, can we humans uh, participate in that salvation. Therefore, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the bridge between God and man that unites those two things together. This is why Christ says, no one comes to the Father but by me. Only through Christ, only because of Christ, are we able to know God and to acquire the likeness of God. However, many church fathers argue that even if man did not fall, he would have still become a human being out of love for us, and that was always uh, the plan for our salvation, was to become like us in order that we may attain the likeness of God. God became man that man might become God, as St. Athanasius the Great says. So it's not just a response to the fall. However, we are fallen human beings, and Christ therefore had to undergo everything that we go through, with the exception of sin. He had to be born just like us, he had to live like us, and of course he had to die. Because as... uh, St. Gregory often said, um, whatever Christ has not assumed, whatever he has not taken up himself and made his own, is not saved. Uh, our mortality is not resolved unless some God himself, uh, Christ himself, actually dies. So, in a way, you could say that Christ actually just, he, he paved a path for us. Um, the path we always trod, it was the one that begins at birth and ends at death. There is, however, a difference between Christ and us. He's like us in humanity and everything but sin. That's one difference. But the other thing, he is, he also not only has the human nature, he has a divine nature. Therefore, death is contrary to his divine nature, and therefore death has no hold over him. And this is why it is through death that Christ triumphs over death. This is why at every busker we sing, by death he has trampled down death. And this is why the death of Christ and the resurrection resolves the problem of the fall, resolves the problem of death. Because only someone who actually is by nature greater than death who is by nature immortal but and eternal, can rise from the dead. But in doing so, let us remember that Christ rose 
in the body. He, he resurrected the human body as well. And after he resurrected, he ascended up to heaven to God the Father. This means that he took human nature up into heaven. He actually is the first man to enter, uh, to, to, to go up into heaven to God the Father. So now our path is not the one that ends at death, but also he leads, we can follow him to God the Father because he, we share in his humanity. It's really quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. Not only does Christ restore us to paradise, to the condition we had before the fall, he gives us something greater. He brings us up to God the Father in heaven. Um, and he makes us his brothers and sisters. This is why we call God Father. A lot of people don't realize how, how uh, shocking and radical it was, the Lord's Prayer, when we say our Father. Christ was put to death for daring to call God Father. No one would ever dare call God Father in the Old Testament. We can call him Father. Why? Because his son became one of us. We are now brothers and sisters of the Son of God. And therefore, we are able to call God Father because Christ became one of us. He is, he is the Son of God by nature. We are the sons of God by grace, by his energies. Another important thing to remember, <clears throat> well, there are two things I want to touch upon now in relation to what we've said about Trinity and Incarnation. The first is, I remember, I think I mentioned earlier, how many of the things we do and believe spring from this belief in Trinity and Incarnation. Two cases I want to mention. The first is our veneration of the Virgin Mary as Mother of God, something a lot of people feel uncomfortable with. We call her Theodogos, uh, which literally means the one who gave birth to God. And I remember there is another heresy that plagued the church, was one called Nestorianism, where Nestor refused to call her Theodogos because he argued she isn't the mother of his divinity, only of his humanity. Therefore, she shouldn't be called mother of God, but mother of Christ or mother of man. It seems logical. Obviously, Mary is not a mother of his divinity. He is without mother in divinity, as he is, as he is without father in humanity. But the problem is he has ignored the basic fact, as John's Gospel says, that the Word became flesh and lived among us. Christ, uh, the Virgin Mary gave birth to God in the flesh. To deny her the title of Theodogos is to deny Christ's divinity. She, we cannot completely separate his humanity from his divinity. They are distinct, just as the three persons of the Trinity are distinct, but they are not separate. Um, she gave birth to God in the flesh. Therefore, she is the mother of God. And that's why we have a profound reverence for her. That's why we venerate her. It is through her that the incarnation is made possible. Every time we venerate the Virgin Mary, we remember the incarnation, we remember Christ. We, re we revere her because we worship her son. And that's why in almost every icon you'll see of the Virgin Mary, she has Christ in her arms. We don't distinguish her from we don't separate her from the Incarnation. So that is actually of fundamental importance. If we do not have, if we do not revere her as Mother of God, we effectively deny the Incarnation. The, our belief about Mary springs from our belief about Christ. The other thing I wanted to mention was icons. Because icons also spring from the Incarnation. In the Old Testament, no one could ever depict God because no one had ever seen him. Let's not get into the burning bush. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that another time because it's a little complicated. But certainly, uh, he doesn't see his face. Moses is told, you cannot see my face. No one can see me and live. You cannot see my face. But anyway, no one knows what the, the God looks like, so he cannot be depicted. However, 
in the person of Christ, he becomes a human being, flesh and blood, like you and me. He was seen by others. People spoke with him. They ate with him. He was as real as you and me. We, we may not know what his exact features were, but we knew he was a human being. We knew he was a male. We knew he was one of the, the Jewish people. So we can depict him as a man. And to deny to depict Christ is again considered by the church fathers tantamount to denying the incarnation. If you do not have the guts to to dare to do that, if you consider that blasphemy or idolatry, you've just rejected the reality of the incarnation, that God became flesh and lived among us. And in general, with the, the, the other icons we have of all the saints, these are all show these this shows us because they all depicted in a similar likeness that through Christ we have attained the likeness of God that the saints have acquired that divine likeness through God's energies through his grace by his love so again what the icon shows us is God became man that man might become God and so the iconography are not just pretty pictures they are of fundamental theological importance. They are a result of the Incarnation. They are our, an expression of our belief in the Incarnation, as is the veneration of the Virgin Mary. So these are not peculiar additions to Christian doctrine. These are part and parcel of Christian doctrine. You, the one cannot exist without the other. So this is... A, a very, just a very basic, uh, simple explanation, but this is basically the, 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 the fundamental uh, teaching of the church, is that God is eternal. He has always been Trinity. There's never a time when the three persons of Trinity were not in existence. They are one God. The second person of the Trinity, uh, they, they, we were created in his image, in the image of the Trinity. We fell from grace, we rejected God. So the second person of the Trinity became man, united us with God again, destroyed death, destroyed the, the, uh, he, he put an end, he reconciled us again so that we could become one with him again, and rose up to heaven to God the Father. He shall come again to judge the living and the dead. And until then, we live with a foretaste of that kingdom to come through the Holy Spirit, which descended upon us, which Christ sent to us after his ascension. Um, and so we live at the mo in this, uh, in this sort of two dimensions. We live in the age of the church, in the age of the Holy Spirit, when we have a foretaste of the life to come, of the kingdom to come. But we are still at the same time living in this fallen world. This is why St. Paul, he, he often speaks in, the, in those sort of contradictory terms, that we are, we are afflicted and yet we rejoice. We are poor, yet we have everything. And this is how it is for, for us Christians. We live in this fallen world. We, we get sick like everyone else. We suffer like everyone else. We die like everyone else. But we still have God with us, the Holy Spirit, the, a sense of... The resurrection is is at hand. It's a, we're already living the life of that uh, kingdom through the church, through the divine liturgy, through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we have this this paradox in Christian life that we we share with the rest of humanity, whatever they believe in in everything. We like them, you know. We, we, we love our children, we need food, we need shelter, we get angry, we lose our tempers, we, we struggle. But at the same time, there's something else. There's that foretaste of the kingdom to come. So, what is fundamental here is that God loved us so much that he became one of us and made us children of God. And everything else that we have in the church, all, all it really is, is our response to that love. Um, the, our worship, 
our prayer, our fasting, our virtues, charity, all of these things is about are we going to respond to the love of God or are we going to reject it? We still have that choice of the first human beings before us. Do you want God's love or do you not? Shall we accept the image and likeness of God or shall we reject it? And so, whether we, even if we are you know, members of the church, baptized, you know, practicing Christians, we still have that battle, that struggle, to reject the fallen uh, way and to try to acquire the likeness of God. And everything else we're going to look at, um, well, not everything else, but many of the other subjects we're going to look at are all about our response to 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 God and what He's done for us. So it's fundamental that we begin with this subject of Trinity and Incarnation, because without it, nothing else we're going to talk about make, makes any sense. So, that is the, that's, that's, uh, the, the, our, the, the, the most fundamental teaching of the church, um, which is expressed in, in countless ways in the uh, church's, uh, the church's tradition. And, of course, Everything we have said is actually summed up perfectly um, in the creed of our church, which Orthodox Christians say in their prayers and at every divine liturgy, and which everyone should know by heart. And for that reason, I am going to conclude with this creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For our sake and for our salvation he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. He rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and together glorified, who spoke through the prophets. In one holy, catholic, and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, I await the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the age to come. Amen.